It's 12.06 in the afternoon here on 90.3 FM. Always great to hear that music on a Wednesday afternoon. That means it's time for Helping Seniors of Brevard. Let's get things underway with the host of Helping Seniors of Brevard. And as I always like to say, the Daily Double, because he's also the executive director of said organization. And that is none other than Kerry Fink. Good afternoon, Kerry. Hey, John Harper, and thank you. It's always fun to be right here on the radio. Radio. We gather around the radio every Wednesday lunchtime, 12 noon to 1 p.m. on 90.3 FM WEJF. And welcome if you're listening to us online at WEJF.net. And if you catch us later, like maybe you're listening to this two weeks from now because you're catching it as a podcast. We're available everywhere podcasts are uh, available. So iTunes Radio, uh, Hey Alexa, Play Me Helping Seniors Radio. Uh, you could check Spotify, iHeart Radio. You're going to find this because what we find is a lot of times when we talk about topics, people like to share this. Man, you should have heard what they were talking about last Wednesday. And so now you can just send them a link and say, catch it as a podcast. So it's good. Uh, so on behalf of Joe Steckler, our president and founder for Helping Seniors, and Nancy Deardorff, our operations director, Karen Wernland, our information specialist, and our whole team over at Joe's Senior Resource Center of Brevard, I uh, want to welcome you to today's broadcast. We're all about getting you information that is going to help you make your aging plan, as Joe Steckler likes to call it. We euphemistically call it getting your ducks in a row. How, whatever term you want to apply – all we're saying is, like, think about some of the things we're going to talk about today and apply them because much like we live in Florida and we understand hurricane plan uh, means you don't want the hurricane, you just want to be ready. That's kind of what we mean when we talk about uh, when we are having this conversation about all events seniors. I can tell you because for now going into our 14th year of operating the um, uh, the Helping Seniors Information Line, uh, what we have learned where we're taking, you know, well over 5,000 calls a year that we are talking to seniors and their families and oftentimes simply because of the facts of the situation, they're trying to navigate a very complicated and t- maybe ticklish or maybe difficult situation. And so we do everything possible to make a difference for those folks as they uh, – give us a call and I'm really honestly surprised at how effective we're able to be. We're a tiny organization. We exist for no other reason than to serve seniors and our families here in Brevard County. We're a non-for-profit Joe Steckler, the same guy who created uh, Brevard Alzheimer's foundation. They call him Joe's clubs to this day. Couldn't stay retired. And he said, you know, Carrie, there's more work that's got to be done for seniors. And at age 90 every day, He's writing articles about homeless, trying to solve the homeless senior problem, and a lot of things. We're gonna we're gonna get into a lot about senior housing today. But I want to introduce our guests uh, because I think you're gonna get a lot out of the program today. One guest you know very well because we've talked a lot, and she's very instrumental in the things that we're trying to do about housing. And then we have somebody who's a very new friend to the world of helping seniors, but. Uh, really has a lot of experience in this same senior housing area as well. So let me start by introducing registered nurse, Tracy Graff. How are you today, Tracy? I'm good, Carrie. Happy to be here. And Tracy is the owner of Avid Home Care. But if you know anything about Tracy's resume and the things she's had experience, let's see, let me see if I get this right. Everything from ER. No. No, OR. You're fixated on ER. For but I'm reason. saying OR. Yeah, OR. What a difference of the one operator. vowel makes, right? <laughs> a, a huge difference. <laughs> but you, you've done OR nursing. Right. You've done psych nursing. Right. You have done, you you, you uh, helped an organization that facilitates organ transplants, and you wrote a book about the topic. Right. And then in addition to all the other nursing experience for many years now, you've owned and operated Avid Home Care, a prime uh, home health agency right there in Merritt Island, right? Correct. We Did actually I... just passed our seven-year anniversary. Look at you guys go. And we're not a chain or franchise, so we're we're pretty proud of that. No, and I love the fact that we, we'll talk about this a little bit as we talk about uh, things that are helpful for seniors to know. Uh, I love the fact that you as a registered nurse, you go out and you actually meet with the clients in part of the how we're going to work together process and your background as a registered nurse really helps you guide and manage the process for the folks that you're 
the the employees who actually then are are providing care are able to manage the case. Yeah, I I think that um, mostly my home care experience is what uh, gives me the ability to go in and do that. But I do all my own client intake admissions. Um, I coordinate their care. Um, I make the care, what's called the care plan, which is basically tells them what they're going to do. And if there's other resources that could be used, um, skilled nursing home care for therapy, uh, many times hospice because of the resource that mm-hmm. they can be. Um, you know, if you can qualify for it, it's a, it's a great resource. Mm-hmm. And they take patients who are on sta- um, service for a long time sometimes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think that that's a benefit to doing the client admissions myself. Plus, I like the connection yeah. because they make the connection with me yeah. first instead of an employee who may or may not stay, yeah. you know. So I'm not going anywhere. Yep. Uh, eventually, maybe, but <laughs> I don't, it's not in the plans. Right. No, I no, I get it. And I, we're going to talk a little bit about, cause, because a question I want to quiz both of you about is how do you find this good help? The other guest, so old friend, new friend. New friend is Jana Bell Coger, who I met through Golden Providers because you've helped us a lot with everything we try to do with Golden Providers, which is its own very tiny little uh, nonprofit, but it exists solely to try to connect business to business. So, so businesses and organizations who serve seniors get a chance once a month to get together, have a lunch, learn some skills that may help them in marketing their own organization and also kind of hobnob and trade business cards and exchange ideas with other people who are in the business. And Janabelle, you come to us with 10 years of experience in assisted living. I mean, you've been through all facets of it. And it was so funny before the show, I was, uh, this is because this is the first time you two guys have had a chance to meet face to face. And I was explaining to you that Tracy his background was registered nurse. And you said, well, that's kind of how I start talk. I think it's cool. The story, how you got into the business of assisted living, because everybody starts from someplace and it's why you're passionate about it. Um, so I started, uh, my husband said, you want a job? You need to go into the nursing. <laughs> <laughs> so I started as a CNA. Um, and I had my baby when she was eight months old. I said, I need to go to work. Yep. So I applied somewhere and um, they said, well, I only have overnight. I'm like, well, hey, that's a great shift. My husband works second shift. I'll do overnights. I'll be <laughs> great. Yeah. No, that was not the case. Um, By the time I was getting sleepy, it was time for him to go to work. So (laughs) that didn't work out very well. Um, So I went from overnight CNA to working day shift. And then within like a year, I got promoted to be the resident care coordinator. Wow. I did that for about two and a half years. And Uh then I moved to a sister property. And I became the uh, business office in that property. I stayed there for three years. So I was with that company all a little over six years. Wow. Wow. And then I've been business office in a couple different communities. And then the last community that I am, I'm the executive director. Wow. So I wanted to ask you both because you've, you know, in your roles, you have a lot of experience working with seniors and their families. Uh, in in your case, Janabel, you're used to seeing them on the, the in the communities that you've been connected with. And Tracy, I know your work, because we've talked about this before, you're go- first of all, you go into people's homes, but there's a lot of cases where you're actually going into f- assisted livings and other places like that, and you're providing services there as well. Because I, I remember we did a radio show that sometimes people move into an assisted living and they think there's going to be maybe more help than is really practical to expect. And so sometimes they find like I still have to bring in some extra help to do it. What I just want to start with this kind of question generally if you're looking for the best quality of life for a senior when they come to see you maybe they're coming to you as a to look for a property or maybe they're coming to you to look for I don't know if I need help at home I don't know if it's good to stay home how do you guys kind of jump in when you're assessing let me start with you on that Tracy and just kind of get some thoughts like you walk in the door and now you've got to sort of try to help guide this senior and their family in the right direction. Well, the first question I ask the client is, what's the, what's the plan? Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, do you want to stay in your home? Do you want to stay in your home until you die? Do you want to die in this home? Um, 
you know, depending upon their level of care, their age, right. what's going on. Not everybody, I, I will ask that right away. Some people are mostly independent and just need a little bit of help. Right. And we're fine with that. You know, I'm, I think a lot of people are reluctant to get home care because they think that it means that they're like raising a white flag and giving up. And, right. and that's not the case. We really try to help people maintain their quality of life and continue to do things that they like to do, but to do it safely and without, you know, overexerting themselves or, or changing their lifestyle because they can't do something anymore. Um, if they want to continue to do it, then, you know, our agency is totally flexible. We have no hourly minimums. We'll be very creative with scheduling. And I believe in not exhausting people's, um, resources and money if they don't need it by applying hourly minimums. I feel that all my clients are eventually going to need more help yeah. unless they move into assisted living. And that comes to the moving into the appropriate level of assisted living, which many times families perceive, you know, well, I'm just going to put mom in assisted living and, and that's going to solve all the problems. And that's where I say to them, that's not necessarily the case. So if that's the reason for why you're doing it, but your parent doesn't want to go, you Maybe might want to rethink that. Right. You might want to rethink that plan. Well, I was thinking even as you were explaining that, you know, one of the challenges, Joe Steckler, our president and founder, who has a lot of experience in this, he goes by his last com command in the Navy before he was retired as a Navy captain, was running the uh, the uh, Navy's retirement home in Gulfport, Mississippi. And I remember early on, he talked about a thing called elements of care because his concern was you got to be careful you don't outlive your money. So he, his point was you got to get the right, right help that you need when you need the help, but understand just what you're saying, that over time you may find that more or more intensive help is needed. Right, and in the meantime, you've been exhausting resources living – somewhere with plush carpets and chandeliers. <laughs> well, that's a way to think about it. So, you know, I just I don't I don't think people really think it through. Um they either don't expect to live as long as they do. Um you know, and just like we talked when we were on the radio with Terry a couple weeks yeah. ago that uh most of the assisted living places if you run out of money, um you have to go. Yeah. We she's referring to we had a great radio show probably a month or so back. Terry, right? Yeah, yeah. Terry Brandt yeah. with um the, the the organization Terry's with is uh Buena Vida Estates and it is literally Brevard County's only what they call continuing care retirement mm -hmm. community. And the issue there is that you come to there for life. They have independent, right. they have I'm trying to remember all the different They aspects. have every level. Of they care. have every level yeah. including if you need skilled nursing, apparently they have that on site. Yep. But but it's a different different model you don't just roll up pay your monthly rent you actually you kind of invest in a long-term care plan that then guarantees you're going to be able to successfully live out your life on property right. Janabel, i wanted to get you into this conversation because uh you come from the cna so that's very much hands-on care kind of background and then you've kind of watched how the world works in assisted livings and they are terrific we always tell our kids if you get tired of us Pop us in. We're good with that because I see, you know, the problem for most of us is what we remember. I'm talking about people who are not in the industry. They think of this much like when we were kids and we had to go see great grandma at the old folks home and it was dark. It was scary. It was smelly. We couldn't wait to get out of there. And that kind of negatively programmed us like, I sure don't want that for me. And yet that's not even remotely what assisted living looks like. Here we are in 2024. How, when you sit down with families and you're trying to help them correctly map their way through this process, what are the things that you talk to them about? I talk about them. <clears throat> I talk to, are they safe at home? What do they need? Um, how quick are you trying to move them here? Do they want to come? How do we involve them in the process, right? Mm -hmm. um, some families wait too long. Yep. So mom and dad can't be involved in the process, right? Because they're at a point that they need 
they're probably at a rehab that they need yeah. to be discharged and they need to find a quick home because they're not safe at home anymore. Right, right. So we ask them, what are you looking for? Activities, you know, meals. They don't have to cook. They don't have to worry about that. They yeah. don't have to worry about their housekeeping, uh, cleaning their apartment. You know, all right. of that takes care of their laundry. We take care of all of that. So those are the questions that you ask them when they're coming to look. And, you know, do you want them to age in place? Yeah. Because that's our goal. It's not just to bring them in through the door to get their monthly yeah. rent, right? It's to help them. So how do we help this resident? Yeah. You know, we work with a number of groups. Uh, one that comes to mind is uh, Denise Bergman. Her and her husband have an organization called Senior Care Authority. And what their role in the marketplace is, they sit down with families and they try to make themselves very, very familiar with all the assisted living options in an area. And if somebody is saying like, okay, it's time to make some sort of a move, then their job is to kind of match up what the senior and their family are looking for and try to narrow down. Because I think I've heard the number, there's like 140 plus different assisted livings that exist. And I know a lot of people, we think we're clever. We go out and do an internet search and we think that's going to give us the answer. And I don't know, if you spend five minutes on the internet, you can sometimes walk away more confused than when you started. And I've heard this a lot. You probably could speak to this too. I've heard a lot of times when the children get involved, they're looking at an assisted living through the eyes of what they might think is good. Like, where's the weight room? Where's the swimming pool? Where's the tennis court? Or things that, does mom play tennis? <laughs> you know, I mean, they're not asking the right question because we don't know the right question. Mm -hmm. How do you walk them through all of that? Um, we ask, what do they like to do? Yeah. What's important for mom? What's important for dad? What, what did they do before this? Yeah. And, you know, sometimes they say, well, these amenities, you guys don't have them. Yeah. yeah, well, we're a homey community. We need yeah. the care. This is, we're giving them care. They need assistance with bathing. They need assistance yeah. with dressing. That's what we want to focus on. Yeah, I'm smiling at because because some of that is a little bit what Tracy was saying, like you're paying for the nice, what, plush carpet and the chandeliers. <laughs> what we really need to be concerned with is what what is our overall plan. One of the things that I wanted to ask you, Tracy, about a little bit is like when, when you guys um, – are how do you you probably get called in when people are trying to make these decisions like is it safe for mom to stay at home or is it or is it um or is or is it time to look for a place to go what do you say about all that okay um i'm sorry i got yeah no my question my, my question was really like you get called in to places where you can ask um yeah, a family who is trying to make a decision like, is it good for mom to be at home or do we need to look at something else? How do you help them balance all that? I um, will a lot of times refer them to one of those uh, nonprofits like the mm -hmm. Care Patrol or mm -hmm. um, a place for mom because they really are very helpful in finding mm -hmm. solutions. I don't know what yeah. all these places are. I wouldn't even attempt to navigate yeah. it. Okay. So it's complicated. And, you know, I, I feel like a lot of times, you know, I'll put us sort of into the mix of whatever the decision might be to fill in gaps. If there are problems at home or if they need full care, I right. mean, you know, it, one of the things we do frequently for people who do need a lot of assistance but can't afford a lot is we do something called a daily split shift where we go for a few hours in the morning and a few hours in the evening, seven days a week. And many times, as long as they're not getting up and wandering around during the day or at night, many times that's sufficient to keep someone safe in their home. Yeah. You're hitting the two busiest times of the day, meal time, bathing yeah. time, dressing time. Um, a lot of them nap in the afternoons. Mm -hmm. And if they, like I said, are not up wandering at night, you know, is there any reason to really be paying for 12 and 24 hours of care? I don't, I don't think so. Right. If you're questioning what they're doing minute to minute, you need, you need somebody next to them all the time. Then that's a different story. And yeah. even if they're in an assisted living, they're not going to provide that. Yeah. Well, that goes back to Joe's point about elements of care. He's like, you got to have the right help that's necessary for that right time. 
And so when we talk when we talk about assisted livings, when we talk about getting help at home, I think there's one common denominator, and I want to make sure I'm saying this right, not putting words in your mouth. But for most people, it's it's really the preference is they should get in touch with with somebody early about this, right? Because yes. I mean, you're you're able to deal. You know, mom can't come home safely now. Something's got to be done in the next 24 to 48 hours. That's a challenge and I know historically both of you guys have have risen to those occasions but isn't the preference so much to see if we can get this figured out like before there's a crisis oh totally except it doesn't seem to matter people <laughs> <laughs> it still is always we're in crisis mode initially um but I mean that's okay I you know from some of my <laughs> some of my former things I've done in my career I, I like that kind of excitement but uh you know, it definitely makes things challenging to do stuff like that. And the other and the other thing that I see a lot of people do is that, like you just said, or or you just said, they wait too long. Yeah. Um. So now we have mom or dad or both with memory issues, decision making problems. Uh. Many times we have no power of attorney. No yeah. healthcare surrogate. No healthcare yeah. surrogate. <laughs> You guys understand and, all of this. And there's the, the adult children saying, well, we're putting her in hibiscus court. And I'm like, mm. you can't do it because you don't have the paperwork. No, you're not, right? You don't have the paperwork. Well, yeah. we'll just go get it. It's too late to get it. Right. I hear that all the time from from, from all of our elder law attorneys. Who would I... we let sign a power of attorney if they can't make, you know, I mean, it just, and that is, that's a fine line, especially here in Florida, um, because we have so many seniors. I think that we really need to be very careful. I am a, very big advocate for seniors and not allowing them to be bullied by their power of attorney. So, um, you know, really it's a piece of paper until it's necessary. Yeah. Uh, and it is not your permission or, or, you know, license to bully them around and say, you're going here and you're going there and you're going to like it. That's a whole topic almost by itself. We're talking with Tracy Graff (laughs) with with Avid Avid Home Care Services. Uh, Just real quick before we go to mid-show break, if somebody wanted to give you a call about uh, home care services, what's a good way to reach you guys? Uh, For me, for home care, I would call the office. um, 321-392-3400. Sounds good. And we'll be right back with more conversation with Tracy Graff and Janabelle Coger talking about senior housing. Stay tuned for second half. And the music of your life continues on this Wednesday afternoon. Carrie Fink is your host of Helping Seniors of Brevard. And let's get more of the program underway. Interesting conversation for today's show. And once again, we'll introduce to you Carrie Fink. Well, thank you, John Harper. Good to be back for the second half of our Wednesday lunchtime gathering right here on 90.3 FM, WEJF and WEJF.net for those of you who are streaming you in, streaming in. And if you uh, are continuing on the podcast, thank you for continuing to be part of the show. And if you are uh, maybe just catching this on the radio and you just started out and maybe missed all the good conversation from the first part, that's the great part that we make these podcasts available. We put them out on our website, helping seniors of brevard we put them in our facebook pages we put them uh on our youtube channel and our objective is to get this information out in the hands where you could share it go back and review it uh send it uh off to somebody that you think it may have value for and so on and so forth because we've been having a really good conversation with tracy graff registered nurse who is the owner of avid home care services and welcome back tracy and also Janabelle Coger, who is a, a a great friend of the Helping Seniors, who uh, we met, had the opportunity to meet through Golden Providers Interaction, which is a great uh, business-to-business uh, little nonprofit that we meet together once a month for lunch and sharing um but both information that's going to be useful to those of us who are committed to serving seniors with excellence, but also a little bit of um, education because there's always an educational component. Welcome back, Janabel. And if you're interested in more information about Golden Providers, I think the next meeting is actually going to be uh, – it always meets on the third Tuesday of uh, the month. There's not a meeting this month, but there is going to be one on the third Tuesday of um, – June, and we're actually going to be meeting at Glenbrook of Palm Bay, which is one of the fine 
assisted living locations here in our county. So they're going to be uh, allowing us to be there and have a lunch. So if you're interested in that, I would invite you to either check out goldenproviders.org so you can learn a little bit more about Golden Providers, or you could just give us a call on the Helping Seniors Information Line at 321-473-7770. And we'll be happy to get you pointed in the right direction. And Janabelle, you've been to some of these meetings, so you know it's, uh, you know, we we learn. Every time we go, we learn. We had a great presentation last month uh, from a gentleman named Carlos Cuesta, who has a company called Synergy Home Care. And he's really located here in Palm Bay area, but he he's a master networker, and so he gave us some really good insight in in learning how to be better networkers. And I think it's just I think it's just good that we get that kind of education each month. It is. It's very good, very helpful tips, and um, it's nice seeing everybody in the community knowing what they do and knowing if we have a situation, who do we go to? Yeah, no, it really is good. It's that it's that you know we always joke it takes a village to raise a child, but the more we go on, the more we talk about the fact that it's important to um to the, the more it's important to realize that it does take a village to raise seniors and we're actually going to kind of shift gears in the second part of the show we're going to talk about a challenge which is interesting because i was saying to janabel um before we got on the air i said you know it's interesting when joe formed this organization said we have to do a senior helpline let's take calls from people um and help them navigate through the things that seniors and their families are facing and legitimately for the first few years it was all questions about transportation legal medical financial lots of questions about things like that and it seems like it's been about two years maybe three years it seems like it was coming out of covid that somehow um housing became beyond like the number one call it's like 60 percent of the calls and it's very frustrating because there's no easy solutions so what's happened is and I've, I, to set the stage about this so that we can talk about this for a few minutes what happened is people seniors becoming ho- housing homeless through really what I would say no fault of their own it's not like they just decided they were going to stop paying rent it wasn't like they just spent their money badly and failed to pay their rent it is that they had been in a very stable situation for many years paying an amount that was barely affordable for them, let's just say $700 a month or something, and maybe they're getting $1,100 or $1,200 from Social Security, they're still having to make decisions, do I buy food or do I buy my medicine? But somehow they could keep a roof over their head. But as things came out of COVID, it changed dramatically. And so a lot of people just said, I'm cashing in, I'm taking the profits on my real estate. The new person bought it said, hey, kind renter who's been here 12 years now you got to pay $1,400 a month for the same thing and if you were younger you'd say well I'll have to get a second job I'll have to uh, uh, maybe see if I can do overtime I'll have to do something because I just got to do what I got to do but for seniors who are on fixed income and probably challenged with some other uh, health issues that's not even on cards on the table and the cruel measure in all of this is that particularly with these corporate landlords and some things, they just don't care. And they're like, you're out on your ear. If you can't pay your rent, we start the eviction process. So there's a whole process about that. In fact, let me interject before we get into this. This very Saturday, Saturday, May 18th, we're continuing our uh, program. We have an attorney. His name is Frank Scaglione, who volunteers his time to lead what is called the Florida Eviction Prevention Project Program. Sadly, it is only informational. It's not like somebody is there with a checkbook to help you pay your rent. However, information is definitely powerful. And so he walks us through what a landlord can do, can't do, what's legal for them to do, what's not legal, what are your rights as the renter. And he's very clear to help you understand you do have rights as a renter but you also have to know your boundaries like we get this is interesting when he does question answer people will say well they were supposed to fix my dishwasher and have it so i don't want to pay rent until they fix the dishwasher valid concern and i love how he phrases he says there are legal reasons he goes there are good reasons to not pay your rent but then there are legal reasons to not pay your rent and you can't mix the two what might be a good reason 
is not going to be allowable legally. And so that's why you have to know your rights. So Saturday morning, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., we are going to meet over at Mima's Barbecue right here on South Babcock in Palm Bay. The event is free uh, because we get some help from the city of Palm Bay. Officially, it's only allowable for uh, 55 plus renters of Palm Bay to join us. We will not turn somebody away, but you do have to call us ahead of time because it is RSVP only. How do you do that? You call 321-473-7770 and tell Karen or Nancy you heard us talking about the radio you'd like to get signed up for Saturday morning. We also have a lady, Vinnie Richardson, whose organization is Christian Housing Ministry. She is a HUD-certified counselor, one of only 3,500 in the United States, and she sits down and again, it's informational, but she can look at your specific situation and try to see if there's options that would, what she calls and what the government calls, and it's a kind word for a difficult problem, housing instability. But that's what she's tasked with doing, and she's also on site with us Saturday morning. The people who have gone through the program have found it exceptionally helpful because a lot of times just knowing where you stand, even when it's not all good news, helps you evaluate how you're going to move on. So, but with that as a preamble, I want to get into the conversation, Tracy, because uh, as you know, this is really taking the forefront and you've kind of been at an epicenter there in uh, Merritt Island because apparently there was a, a longtime senior residence established that uh, was helpful for lower income senior citizens and apparently got gobbled up into some big nameless group who decided they were going to make improvements to the property supposedly but then also decided they were going to make improvements to the amount of rent they were collecting at the great distress of the seniors who live there and it's created a big senior housing homelessness situation and one of the ladies that um, we've been connected with she's come to at uh, both Tracy and her name is uh, Doris the, you guys have both come to our Brevard Commission on Aging meetings and explained the seriousness of the problem to everybody's on the commission sadly you know the problem is the commission doesn't have much authority if any other than just basically report what we're hearing we need to find better ways to do this so we've collectively decided there has to be a housing roundtable, not just to complain about the problem of affordable housing, but try to seek solutions. And our solutions within the home, within the helping seniors world have really been what I say anecdotal. Like each case, you have to look at each case and work at it. But we're trying to find things that are going to make a difference now for a senior, not two years from now when a new politician promises I'm going to do something. Tracy, talk a little bit about this. Yeah, so I got involved, as you know, Kerry, about a year ago, a um, little more than a year ago now, I guess, after writing an article about senior homelessness and what the future looks like for that. And I was contacted by some of these people in Merritt Island who were being evicted. Yeah. I didn't know anything about what was going on, but as I started to dig deeper into the situation, it got uglier and uglier. Yep. And I found that that's exactly what was happening, The the... All of the low-income apartment buildings in Merritt Island, there are also two in Titusville and two in Cape, were sold in a group purchase to an investment group from New Jersey. Um, They painted them, changed the names, raised the rent, and kicked people out. Um, I don't know what to say. There was mass evictions in Merritt Island. They were the lowest rent apartments in the area. And I don't know where all these people have gone. Um, Many of them are still sort of hiding around Merritt Island. Um, We now have the change in the laws where, um, and we have, I've actually seen this happening in the last few days. The police are going into the homeless camps and breaking them up and moving people out. Uh, It's now become illegal to sleep outside in Brevard County overnight. Wow. So um, I'm not sure who thinks that's going to help the situation. Well, or what the ultimate result from that is. Uh, I don't think anybody cares. Yeah. You know, what What occurred to me as we were talking about this, because Doris Doris uh, works with one of the big food banks that's run by yeah, the church. East and, Coast Christian Center. And, and she came in and she said, what's happening is, she says she could tell by the cars, first of all, just a huge number of cars showing up. All and of them have doubled. 
in their number of people yeah. just right around the time that that eviction happened. Right. It was last, it was 2023, May, April, May, is when all of the food banks in Merritt Island doubled the number of people who were coming. It's, it's incredible when you think about it. And she would, she tells a story that you would tell because you could see all their earthly possessions are like loaded in the car. They're living in their car. They're living in their car. And, and I thought one of the points that you guys brought up to the Brevard Commission was, you know, what happens is you, maybe if you're a younger person and you're evicted, you call your friends and say, I'm going to sure. come crash on your house. Uh, you have your, a lot of options. Yeah. But when you're a senior, what they explain is, you know, basically when you go through this Florida eviction prevention program and attorney Frank walks you through the process at the end of the day, when you get to the end of that road and the sheriff puts your possessions on the curb and locks the front door and you can't go in there anymore because that legal process is finished, you know, other people say, well, I'll catch a bus and I'll go stay with my brother and wherever. That's not possible. And so what apparently happened with these seniors is there, I heard the reports of suicides. I heard yes. the fact that they're just like, they don't have any place to go. So they're like literally right there. Somehow in the, I guess like eight months that I was working with a couple of residents in the apartments in central Merritt Island, in that a complex, there was, there were 10 deaths. I don't know the ages. I don't know the reasons. The talk among the residents was that uh, many of them were seniors and they felt like they just gave up. Yeah. So, so I, you know, and I understand they're watching their senior citizen neighbors who have lived in these places for years being flushed out. All their belongings being thrown into the dumpsters out back. I have pictures of mountains of trash during that time because they were kicking people out that had nowhere to go. Yeah. So they can't take their belongings with them. So it, it's a whole different ball game when you uproot and and evict a senior citizen. Yeah. You know they've now lost all of their important documents. They're many times it disorients them. Um, okay, they go to the food bank and get in line for food. What, they don't have anywhere to put it. They don't have anywhere to keep it cold. Yeah. They don't – I mean it It creates so many problems and I'm telling you they're like invisible people. Yeah. They're, they're hiding and living among us. They I'm, – I'm sure at this point are terrified and that the police are going to come and arrest them, which you know our, our judicial system is already way overwhelmed. Yeah. So let's add senior and mentally ill homeless people to it. I mean, it, it, there just isn't any answers. And like I've said to you before, as I've observed this and yeah. worked in it and around it for over a year, I don't feel like I'm any farther ahead than I was a year ago, except I know more. Yeah, you know, I think the problem is if it was an easy problem to solve, it would be solved. And we've talked about, I want to say the, I don't mean it like terrible, but the apathy and the appetite of our political uh, folks to really take a look at it because I guess you don't get bonus points for being a hero in this. It doesn't raise your political contributions or anything like no. that. So what we've decided to do, because rather than just complain and complain and complain, we've got to try to do some things that make a difference, you know, because right. if what's the definition of an insanity is doing the same thing, expecting a different response. I won't do that. So <laughs> I love, Dre, well, you're, you're, a, do that. you're a fireball about this and so is Doris. Yeah. Uh, and I want to talk about the fact that we agreed we're going to create, uh, we're creating a um uh, uh in the in the helping seniors world we want to create this round table because the idea is not to sit around and complain about how bad it is but to try to talk about solutions everybody says the solution is affordable housing so fine whatever they decide is yeah, going to be 5 that years anymore, in the, in the right? future i don't want to hear that anymore what do we because do? then you get into the whole thing about what the building costs are and what yep. this and that and then now you're not talking about affordable housing right and plus we're you know we're we're piecemealing we're building all these affordable housing complexes and we're giving like 5% of the apartments to senior citizens yeah. okay that's it's just we need solutions now, yep. like now. Yep. And I mean, I drive around Brevard County. I see a lot of empty buildings. Yep. Why aren't they being used to house seniors? Why don't we have an emergency shelter that only allows people in over 65? You know, it's funny because literally last week uh, we were on vacation and we were up actually uh, one of the stops we were in was Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. And I was really surprised that the people we were traveling with who were from Halifax we're saying that they have, they're seeing for the first time in Canada the same problem that we're dealing with down here. Yeah. That what's happened up there <clears throat> is the housing market has gone through the roof. 
and what it's done is it's displaced a lot of people, particularly seniors. And, you know, that's a without getting into the political aspect, it's supposed to be a very socialistic kind of country where they really are trying right. to look after it. But apparently it's becoming a problem there, too. So let's talk about the things that you and Doris are starting up to, to really try to make a a like okay it's what this you know we've all heard the old thing the starfish on the beach the guy comes along and <clears throat> this i this, tell that story yeah you know as the guy's That's running my starfish the little the little kids running down the beach throwing a starfish because like there's thousands of them on the beach what are you doing you know you can't save them all yeah but i just saved this one yep threw another one back in the water i just saved this one yep and it's one at a time isn't it yes and that's what we're trying to do. So Doris um, is like my uh, my my man on the scene. She's, <laughs> <laughs> She's and, great. And I've asked her to start basically creating a database of mm-hmm. people. You know, she's always telling me about these people, these people, these sad. So what I'm doing now is I'm asking her specifics. Yes. Who are they? How old are they? What's the situation? Right. What's going on? Mm -hmm. So her and I together, and I mean, we're focused on Merritt Island right now because that's where the crisis appears to be insane. And that's also where she has connection to the food banks. Yeah. So, um, you know, I have permission to give out her cell phone number. I am going to give out my cell phone number. And we are putting ourselves out there to seniors that are in some kind of unstable housing situation or some kind of crisis to call us. Yeah, and I want to, I wanna, if you're listening to this, I want you to pay very close attention to what we're talking about. Because, again, when I talk about 5,450 calls last year, you can do the math, 60% of those were housing calls, very tough, very difficult, but we have to find anecdotal solutions. And what those end up being is like, you know, there's no simple answers, but you're looking for uh, places where somebody could share a room. You're looking for uh, places where people can manage within their circumstances. And there are solutions out there, but you really have to work hard for them. You do. And I mean, you know, I've talked at the Commission on Aging meeting about doing something as simple as ex- widening the eviction window for, for seniors to right. 90 days, um, knowing that it's going to take us longer to find them somewhere to go right. if they are evicted for some right. reason. Right. You know, something as simple as that doesn't necessarily cost anybody anything. They're right. still paying rent yeah. during the time that they're there. But you're giving us more time to try to find them somewhere because once they're actually homeless – then we have a real problem. So we want to prevent that from actually happening. Yeah. Um, even if it's just, you know, I call your landlord and negotiate with them that we need to try to get you out of there, but it's going to be very challenging. You so know, yeah. it, I, I think that it does require someone intervening yeah. in each situation, but it's not going to be the same intervention for each one. So it's, it is very complicated. Yeah, no, it is. It is. And Janabelle, you've been, you've been patiently listening to the whole conversation, but I know you see this kind of firsthand. I just want to ask for your thoughts and comments because it really, you know, there's a thing we talk about when you're a younger person facing homelessness, the focus is on, we got to help this family get back on their feet, right? It's like maybe, maybe there was a, uh, a, a poor choice of careers and maybe we get them some better training. They're going to get a better job, get on the right track. Maybe there was some complication with some addiction or something else that caused the problem. If we can get that straightened out, the rest is going to be smooth sailing. And so there's an approach that people want to take with homelessness for younger folks, but it's a different story when you're a senior, because it's not like, oh, let's get you trained for a new job. Let's, um, you know, the the issues are, are, it's much, it's a much different thing. You're, you're going to be on this fixed income. Your income is not going to change. And so, so you, it's not like, well, we can rehabilitate the individual or the family. Mm-hmm. It's like, we have to deal with this person right here where they are. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenging situation for um, our elderly population that is encountering that. One of the things, um, like, you know, we, we have residents that can run out of money, right? Yeah. So one of the things that is offered, which is kind of hard, you have to jump through hoops to be able to get approved, right, yeah. is the Medicaid. But yeah. some of these people are probably are not medically needy to the point where Medicaid would be approved, yeah. right? Um, and when you're not in a um, hospital rehab setting, it does take a little bit longer yeah. for that process. Everything now is online, right? So yeah. to be able to find somebody to help uh, that person apply for those benefits, it also can be a little bit um, overwhelming for them. So it, it's a lot. 
Um, however, there are very limited resources out there. But if we can get together to, you know, see how we can help them get access to the ones that are available, then that would be a great help as yeah. well. No, I agree. And Tracy, I've asked you to really help us in the helping seniors world. You've written, you've been kind, you've written articles, you've attended meetings, you've connected or tried to connect, let me say, with many of the politicians with very, yeah. very limited success, but not for lack of trying. No, it's not for lack of trying. And How, I'm about but, to ramp it up. So absolutely. Uh, so what do we do? What, what do we do next? We want to, we're, we're wanting to establish a, like a round table well, we don't sit around and complain, but we're going to try to do some stuff. Where are we on that, and what's the next step, and what do you want it, somebody to do who's hearing this right now and say, I'm mad about this, and I want to... Contact wanna... your local politician and ask them why they're not answering the request from Helping Seniors or Brevard Housing Task Force <laughs> okay. to have a meeting. Okay. That's what you could do, honestly. Yeah. Um, you know, I got a canned response from one of our local politicians that basically said they have to wait till something changes in Washington. I really <laughs> would prefer that no one say that to me ever again because wow. this is a bipartisan problem. I don't talk politics. I don't care what party you're affiliated with, very honestly. If you're a local politician in this area, then you have the power to do something. If we have multiple politicians in this area, then we have more power to do something. But what I see happening over and over again is that this world is such a mess that the senior problems continue to get brushed under the rug, pushed to the back of the line. There aren't enough of them complaining. There aren't enough of them homeless. Mm -hmm. We don't know where they are. They don't exist. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't see them. Where are they? Um, it's things like that that just continually gets them pushed to the bottom of the priority list. I show Commission on Aging gave out what the – millions and millions of dollars that were mm -hmm. given to the Department of Elder Affairs in Florida for their budget this year, and there are wonderful programs they're giving mm -hmm. money to. But as I pointed out, there's not a single dollar, not a single dollar on that that, that could help a senior that calls one of us today and says, I'm going to be homeless tomorrow and I don't know what to do. Yeah, it is incredible. You know, that needs to change somehow. And the only people who can change it are the people who supposedly work for us, yeah. except they act like royalty and that we have to approach them <laughs> like, um, I don't know, uh, beggars or something. I mean, it's, it's honestly, and I'm not someone to talk about politics because I hate it so much. It's ridiculous that they claim they work for us, we vote them in office, and then they do whatever it is their agenda they want to do and don't listen to their constituents. Well, let's – let's because we, we are going to run out of time, uh, at least for this episode okay, of Helping Senior Radio. numbers out. So let's right. give some numbers. I need to give out – I'm going to give out my cell phone number and Doris's cell phone number, and if anyone does – feel like they are in a housing unstable crisis or something and you are over 65, you can call one of us. If we don't answer, leave us a message and we will definitely get back to you. My cell phone number is 321-506-8591 and Doris's cell phone number is 814-386-8902. You can text or call us. We would be glad to try to help. Um, and, of course, my office number for my agency is 321-392-3400. Tracy Graff, a uh, registered nurse with Avid Home Care, who's heading up the Helping Seniors Homelessness uh, Roundtable, where we're trying to figure out how we're going to work this and make this a little bit more helpful for the seniors that are out there. Uh, if you missed any of these numbers, want more information, our number, the 321-473-7770, is a great number to call. So with that, Tracy Graff, thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Janabelle, for uh, being with us today on this edition of Helping Seniors Radio. We'll be right back here on the radio next Wednesday, 12 noon to 1 p.m., right here on 90.3 FM WEJF. We'll see you then.